on behalf of University Housing, we're honored to have you join us in the Living Learning Center this evening for our final community conversation of the year. We've had, let's see, at this point, 20, no, 18, 18 community conversation panels this year. So this is our final one, so thank you for joining us. Uh, tonight's community conversation panel is titled A Day at the Races, Tracktown, USA, Eugene, Oregon, Hayward Field and the Rise of American Running Culture. And I just want to thank the students who put together this evening's panel, the Walton Advisory Board, which is one of the two student groups that organizes the Community Conversation Panel, the Walton Advisory Board and the Hamilton Think Tank. So thank you to the <laughs> HTT students. And we do have refreshments this evening and some cake. We're thanking our four-year uh, service of our cameraman, Wade, in the back. He's been a trusty helper. So he's graduating and on his way to London. So we're appreciative of his work. Uh, we also have a drawing this evening. We have some door prizes, and unfortunately, it's uh, for undergraduate students only, but if there are any undergraduate students in the audience who would like to enter the door prizes, we have Kenny Moore's book, we have some other Eugene 08 apparel, and we have uh, a few uh, Hayward Field uh, cards that have been signed by the panel this evening. So there'll be some ballots you can sign, and you can put Audrey's holding up one of the hats over there. So we'll, we'll do that drawing at the end of the panel this evening. And I also want to introduce our panel. We had a chance to uh, tour Hayward Field, and for those of you that had a chance to join us, you've heard a brief introduction, but I just want to tell you a little bit more about who's joined us this evening. Uh, Joe Henderson, in the middle, uh, has written 27 books on running and countless magazine articles. He's also the author of Joe's Journal, which is a column for Marathon and Beyond, uh, and was for more than 30 years a columnist and editor at Runner's World. He's a veteran of more than 700 races, uh, and Joe teaches running classes at the University of Oregon and coaches a local marathon team. And so thank you for joining us, Joe. Uh, Janet Heinenen, make sure I'm not standing in front of folks to introduce them, uh, is the editor and publisher of Keeping Track Newsletter, established in 1992. She also serves as an editor for Runner's World Daily Online and a columnist for Bell Lab. Uh, she is the former Women's Sports Information Director at the University of Oregon and the former editor of International Runners Committee Newsletter. She is the author of Sports Illustrated Running for Women and the co-author with Tom Heinenen of All About Road Racing. Uh, she ran her first marathon in 1970 and recently retired from coaching the University of Oregon women's track team for 28 years. Uh, she's also a longtime Oregon Track Club volunteer. <laughs> oh, now that I'm going into Tom's. Okay, sorry about that, Tom. <laughs> And so Tom's also joining us this evening, and I didn't have his bio as prepared as I should have. He was uh, originally um, officiating a softball match this evening, I think, but was rained out, and so we're, we're fortunate to have Tom Heinen joining us this evening as well. So thank you, Tom. And moving on to Laura Cole. She is a co-owner of the Eugene Running Company. Uh, she's a retired international class long-distance runner. Uh, she represented the USA 17 times as a member of the national team, including the World Cross Country Championships, the World Cup of Track and Field, the IAAF World Championship Road Race, and Pan American Games. Uh, she has traveled the world extensively on the professional road racing circuit and competed in the 1988, 92, 96, and 2000 U.S. Olympic team trials. And Brad Hudson, our, our other panelist this evening, uh, originally from New Jersey, had the honor of breaking many long-standing state and course records. He moved to Eugene when he was a senior in high school. Uh, Brad ran for the South Eugene Axman prior to being admitted to the University of Oregon. Uh, he was a star runner, former Pac-10 winner for the Ducks in cross country. After college, Brad made a number of world marathon teams, running a personal best of two hours and 13 minutes. Uh, Brad has dedicated his life to running. He has, ru uh, he has ran for the U.S. Army and is now a coach of some of the most promising U.S. distance runners. So, Brad, thank you for joining us. And if everyone would join me in thanking our panel this evening. <laughs> Just to give you a sense of our format, we designed this to be fairly casual and conversational, so we don't really have a formal lecture presentation this evening. And before I turn it over to the panel for discussion, I also want to introduce uh, Heather Briston, who is the University of Oregon historian and archivist, and she was kind enough to bring over a sampling of some of the materials from the Bowerman collection in the special collections. And so Heather's going to briefly tell us what she brought this evening, and you're welcome afterwards to come up and take a look at some of the archival materials. So. 
Thank you, Kevin. Um, yes, I just want to let you know, after the panel this, after, uh, this evening, I will stay and so will the materials. But just to let you know, we have both the uh, papers of Bill Bowerman. We have uh, over 91 boxes of uh, Bill Bowerman's papers, everything related to his life from his coaching to also his shoe development and everything that he did. And then we also have um, over 400 of his films, about a third of which we've converted so that they're viewable. But today I brought papers that relate to his coaching career, as well as his shoe development, his conversations with Arthur Lydiard about jogging and how he brought jogging here uh, after coming uh, visiting Arthur in New Zealand. And then I also have great things like shoe tread and uh, play, uh, the x-rays of spike placement. So all sorts of interesting, varied things from Bill Bowerman. But then I also, I am the university's historian and archivist, so one of the things that I document is also uh, the history of our athletics. So I brought a selection of some of our photographs from our uh, athletic collections that sort of show mainly our, I did our coaches today, because I don't have a lot of room. So <laughs> So I have uh, most of the photographs of some of our coaches that have coached track and field over the years. And so afterwards, please come up and look at this and also know that there's a lot more of this where this came from. So if this is something that you're interested in, I'm in the night library and I'm just dying to have come over people come over and look at the materials we have. So thank you. I'll go ahead. I never mind talking. Ooh. But the mic doesn't like me, so. <laughs> Let me turn that around so I can do that. Uh, there is uh, a film here, a DVD that was just recently, the bonus feature is on the Fire on the Track. Fire on the Track, there were several things made about uh, Shoe Prefontaine. Two theatrical movies, uh, there's been a book written, but uh, to my mind, the best pieces is the Fire on the Track documentary. It came out in 1995. We won't ask you to sit here for an hour-long uh, showing of fire, fire on the Track, although it's well worth your while to see it sometime. There are some added features just very recently uh, produced, History of Hayward Field and, Pre and Prefontaine Queen Trail. I think you'd enjoy seeing. They're both about five minutes, but I think we should talk first and then show those later uh, because uh, we've got to earn our keep up here in front. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to say something extra about Hayward Field that uh, you may not know, and you probably are very well aware of the Olympic Trials and Shoe Prefontaine Classic coming up, and all the records that have been set there, and the Olympic Trials previously that have been run there, but obviously the fastest runners in the world have, have run there. There's been world records set, there have been uh, American records by the bushel that have been set there, but also some of the slowest runners in the world run at Hayward one of the things that separates Hayward Field from a lot of other facilities around the country and around the world is that most of the time the gates are not locked. They are locked right now, and that's for a good reason. They've been locked pretty much for the last year because of construction and now final preparations for Olympic trials. But we can hope as of sometime in July that the gates will come open again and remain open 24 hours a day because that's one of the things, I think Bill Bowerman's greatest creation or greatest legacy was that he brought running to the masses. And uh, a lot of the techniques that he developed for his athletes at the University of Oregon, he then scaled down and uh, brought what was known at the time as jogging to this country. And uh, that was in the 1960s. He w wasn't the one who invented it because it, I don't think it really had an inventor, but he's the one who popularized. And one of the, there's, I could talk for an hour about just about that contribution, but one of the things that Bowerman uh, insisted upon was that Hayward Field be a community facility and not just a University of Oregon facility. And that it would be open to the public for use uh, most of the time. And most of the years that I've been in Eugene, that's been more than 25 now, uh, Hayward Field has been open to the public for
teach classes at the university and running. We use Hayward Field uh, some of the time. What I tell students that who may not be aware of it, what a privilege it is to use this facility where some of the best athletes in the world have run. But to also, when they use it, use it with good manners. And that is, don't try to use it in the hours when it's restricted. And don't run on the inside lane at a, at when you're taking your, your slow runs, when somebody else might be training very fast on the inside lane. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's an honor to run there. And I hope you'll, if you haven't had a chance to run there before, once the gates go open again, you will take the opportunity to go there. I have wonderful memories of Hayward Field, as I'm sure everybody here does, and there will be very different memories. Uh, but some of my best memories don't have anything to do with uh, the stadium being full and somebody setting a record. It's some of the runs I take at 6 o'clock in the morning when I'm the only one out there. And yet I, um, I, the, the stands can be filled with memories, and the track can be filled with memories as well. One of the things I like to do, too, is uh, when I take my token laps around Hayward Field, I like to go by and slap Bill Bowerman's hand <laughs> on his statue just to thank him for all he did. Most people, uh, when they think of Hayward Field, they think of Steve Prefontaine, but to my mind, Bill Bowerman, without Bill Bowerman, there would, would have been no Steve Prefontaine. The pre was a, there still would have been physically a Steve Prefontaine, but I don't think he would have been nearly the, uh, the athlete and the legend that he was because he was so good coming out of high school that most coaches would have been tempted to race him to death. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that Bowerman, one of the magic uh, elements of Bill Bowerman's training was that he knew when to hold people back or how to hold people back. And that was a very difficult thing to do with Steve Prefontaine. And uh, he saw the results. So enough for me. Maybe <laughs> that's, that's the way to start. Some of our best memories of, of, uh, of Hayward Field. I can, I, I could, I could start. <laughs> My, my best memory was the time when I left, when I uh, led Steve Prefontaine in, the, in a race in, the, in Hayward Field. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, I, and in fact, I led the entire Twilight Mile field at, at Hayward Field. And uh, I don't know whether Tom, did, Tom, did you run the, the, the oh. AAU <laughs> Marathon Championship in 1971? Yeah. Here at um, Hayward? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> they had the championships yeah. here, and they started in the afternoon. Pan American Marathon Trials. Pan American Marathon Trials. They started the marathon at something like 3 or 4 in the afternoon and at a time when we didn't realize that uh, running in hot weather was not the greatest thing to do. And uh, I was in the marathon. The marathon had a three-hour time limit to enter. You had to run three hours or better. And they also had a three-hour cutoff time because the marathon was due, or the, the twilight mile was due to start at three hours after the marathon had begun. So they were going to, anybody who was slower than three hours was going to not get to come in and run their final lap around the stadium. And so I was, kept looking at my watch and looking at my watch. I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it. And I got the, the, to the stadium about uh, one minute before the, the cutoff time. And I came into the track and I started up the back straight. We had to run our final uh, three quarters of a lap around Hayward Field. So we came in the south east gate and we took a right turn onto the track, and next thing I heard was bang, and the, uh, <laughs> the, the twilight mile started coming around the turn. I was running along the outside lane, and uh, the mile, they, they didn't, didn't take them long to catch me, but I can always say that I led Steve Prefontaine for, for coming on the back stretch of a, of a mile race, and that's, that's one of my greatest memories. And that was my first trip to Eugene, and uh, I, I, I said at the time, someday I'd really like to live here. I didn't think it would be possible to ever live in Eugene, but I said, this, this is a place I'd really like to live. And 10 years later, after coming here for two Olympic trials and that, that national marathon, I got a chance to live in Eugene. And, and my first thought when I got here was, ah, I'm home. You know, I'd lived in California for quite a while, and I didn't, uh, uh, and I loved living there, but I always felt like I was visiting in California. And when I came to Eugene, I said, yeah, this is it. This is the place. And I've been here ever since. So, love it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just memories of Hayward. <laughs> yeah. Memories. Yeah. Or Eugene, just the Eugene in general. Um, probably my best memories of Hayward was watching the UCLA Oregon dual meet. Um, this would have been 1984, was the year that Joaquin Cruz won um, the Olympic 800. And he had come here he, uh, from Utah, I think, with his coach Luis de Oliveira and um, uh, 
had had a lot of injury problems. He's very young, and uh, so he'd come here, got healthy after seeing Stan James here, and um, it came down to UCLA and Oregon uh, on the mile relay, um, and Joaquin Cruz got it maybe three feet ahead of their great 400 meter hurdler, and uh, he held him off. I don't, for me, that was one of the best things about Hayward. We're just watching that meet. I think uh, I was in high school. It was really pretty special. But I mean, there's a lot of different memories though of Hayward. I think there's probably too many to mm -hmm. to say, but um, probably uh, that's be mine. That's all right. Um, I have a lot of memories from running track meets here and just from watching them too, but a um, couple memories. I In 2001, I was pregnant with my daughter, and NCAAs was the week uh, before the birth of my daughter, and um, the Nationals was the week after. And she wasn't due till after, after, but in Joe Joe's birthday is the same day. <laughs> I went into labor yeah. right in between the two meets. Yeah. <laughs> Had the baby right after that first meet on on Monday morning. Came back and brought her on Saturday. She was six days old yeah. <laughs> and nursed her in the stands way up high. <laughs> so her first track meet was when she was six days old, and she stayed for three or four days. She went through every track meet, and, and she was never afraid of the gun. Still not afraid <laughs> she got used to that gun. Um, so that's one of my favorite memories. But um, another one was coming up here for Twilight. I had always heard the legend of Twilight meet, and I was still living in Arizona at the time, and I called Tom and. Tom said, oh, well, you know, the only one's really going to be competitive with you is Annette Peters, but she's got the flu right now. <laughs> so, so she probably won't run really well. Well, I came up here, and I think Annette ran about 8 or 1542 or something with the flu, and needed to say one, and I think I was second or third. I can't remember, but it was a great race anyway. But uh, I was like, wow, that woman ran that with the flu. <laughs> just, just think what she would have done without it. But uh, And I then I moved there a year later, and uh, had a lot of great twilights after that, and always always ran well at twilight meet. But that's my I just remember it fondly from being the, fir the year before I, I moved here, and it made me want to move here. And it's been 15 years later, and I'm still here. So that, that's about it. It's got a powerful lure. This town. Yeah. Brad came here uh, for for high school and then college, left and has come back. Laura came here from far away. Mm -hmm. And eventually came back. I came here <laughs> from far away and came back to stay. Tom came from uh, Minnesota by way of other places and, mm -hmm. and came to stay. But Janet has always I'm been here. Yeah. <laughs> Janet been was born here. here. Yeah. So uh, she's the she's the storehouse of lore about Eugene. Yeah, she's I'm seen it all school, personally. The, the oldest living whatever. <laughs> 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 but, uh, how many people have heard of the three bills? Can anybody yeah. tell me who the three bills are? No, how about a student? Any students there know who the three bills? How does non-student? Mm -hmm. Three bills? Okay. Who are the three bills? Hayward, yeah, yeah. Hayward Bowerman, and Dellinger. So Hayward Field is named after Bill Hayward. And Bill Bowerman you know about, and Bill Dellinger uh, followed Bill Bowerman. But uh, I've had a lot of questions coming in because of the trials, people wanting to know, well, how did Eugene become Track Town USA? And the track history here, you know, and why do these people end up wanting to move to Eugene because of, of track and field? It's not a very prominent sport, really, in this day and age. But uh, Bill Hayward's the guy that you can probably say thank you to for bringing these people mm -hmm. to town. Uh, he became the coach here, I think, around 1905 and was the coach for, I believe, 44 years yeah. until his death mm -hmm. in 46 or 47. He had world champ, excuse me, he had Olympic champions and world record holders on his team. He was on uh, the coaching staff for, uh, I believe, six different Olympic teams. He was a real character himself. He'd been, he was a Canadian who'd, you know, been a sparring partner for gentleman Jim Sullivan. He uh, you know, played lacrosse, he played hockey, he did professional races, foot races, earned as much as $600 in a day, you know, running anywhere from 50 yards to 600 yards, uh, real interesting fellow. Uh, also, in sort of foreshadowing Bill Bowerman's accomplishments off the field, tinkering with things like running shoes, Nike. You know, Bill Hayward was best known for uh, helping, you know, I don't want to say disabled athletes, but you know, one of his champion javelin throwers didn't have a thumb on his throwing hand, and he showed him how to 
Velcro, and he would cobble together braces and um, some designs with shoes to help athletes who he had some impediment to you know, what, he, what they would want to be physically for their sport. So here was Hayward, who had a reputation with world-class athletes, but also served you know, the lesser world-class athletes. And then he handed off to Bill uh, Bowerman, and Bowerman, who was the coach from the late 40s to the early 70s, just did something unheard of. <coughs> and that was totally getting this community involved in track and field, and getting the movers and shakers and the people with money and the people with time and talent getting this community excited about track and field at a time when they were super excited about football and basketball. And it was still a small town and you know you just sort of had to do your elbow rubbing and elbow whatever twisting <laughs> arm twisting. <laughs> arm twisting. <laughs> and so so Bowerman made meets fun to watch. Uh, he got lots of people involved and they went from, you know, our all covers meets, which started in the early 50s and got people at a very young age and developmental age going. In the early 60s, he brought the jogging idea back from Arthur Lydiard in New Zealand. The Parade Magazine publishes something about jogging, and it hits the United States, and pretty soon Bowman's putting out some books about jogging, and he's running uh, jogging programs, you know, kind of research programs, really. Dr. Harris from the university, and people like myself and you, and a lot of people realized, oh, you know, I don't have to be a world class runner to, you know, to try this running thing. And boy, they got hooked. And so he created a lot of fans, really, because uh, you know, they considered themselves participants at their own level. And he also had his athletes working with the, many of the beginning uh, running jogging groups. So this community uh, relationship, and he recruited a heck of a lot of professors from the university to come officiate at his meet. So, you know, incredibly, um, you know, resourceful at, at bringing many people together. And so that spun off, and pretty soon we were hosting Olympic development meets, and eventually we hosted our first national championship in 1971, and then and Olympic trials in 72, 76, 80, and a lot of big things were, were happening here. Uh, and Bill Dellinger came uh, after Bowerman and, and really kept things going. Uh, he had very much of an open door policy, and hey, you know, he might not know anybody, everybody's name on his, among his distance runners, because there might have been a hundred of them, but you know, if you just sort of stuck with it and stayed healthy, uh, like Art Boileau, uh, kid from Portland, a Canadian, uh, I don't think he came in with any credentials, but ended up being a, a 212 and I think an Olympic marathoner, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, a walk-on. Walk yeah, yeah. 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 so, uh, you know, so the, the team, the teams are really good. Tom, you know, started coaching in the mid-70s, uh, brought the women's team into the program, and, and they were pretty well accepted, and they were very successful, and, uh, you find acceptance comes easily when you're, you're good at what you're doing. And so, uh, you know, the, the women you know, got a, a pretty nice position here, which you didn't find anyplace else in the country. I mean, y you wouldn't find eight or 10,000 people at a co-ed dual meet anywhere else in the country. So, so there's three bills and a Tom, <laughs> kind of <laughs> put us where we are now. What about the other two bills? Pardon? The other two bills. The, the other two. Bills. Pardon? The five bills. The five four, the other bills. Four, four, the, well, the other two before. Oh, Bill T William Trine and hmm, I think that's the first track. Was it the first track coach ever? Yeah. Uh, oh, Trine was the first Trine, and then there was an interim. There was an interim uh, coach. Uh, Bill Lanana. Oh. Bill. Uh, Bill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bill Smith. Bill Smith. Yes. Yes. Uh, I'll think about the other one. Yes. Okay. Right. Bill Smith. Bill, right? Bill Hayward. Yeah. Bill Hayward lived over by the mill race on the second story of a building over there that was a restaurant. Yeah. The uh, landing, something, uh, the uh, landing? Uh, um, the, an the Anchorage. The Anchorage. Yes. My, my father ran for Bill Hayward on the same team as Bill Bowerman, so mm -hmm. I get these yeah. stories but Bill Hayward from a long lived time in ago. Anchorage, 
Yeah. Two-story building over the mill race over there by where all the art, the by where the <laughs> art. <laughs> over there. Over, <laughs> over there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and every morning there was a chute outside of his his window, and every morning he would slide down the chute into the mill race <laughs> and go swimming in the mill race oh before he did anything else. So the story goes. I read it in Oregana. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> he also made a he made a he made a shoe for a field goal kicker oh, who right. had half a foot. Yeah. 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 So he was he was really he was into the sort of the prosthetics thing way before most he's people. Football coach too, right? He yeah. was. He was a trainer. And yeah, Bill they called Hayward. Him Colonel, they called him Colonel Bill. Colonel well, Bill. And the stadium. They the named the stadium after Bill Hayward at halftime of a football game. <laughs> And he was there, except he at halftime he was down at the locker room, retaping somebody's foot or something, and he missed the ceremony. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't know that he had the stadium named after him. It was supposed to be a surprise. Speaking of prosthetics, what do you guys think about the Jesus foot earring that's now at the Bell Run with the blades? With blades? Yeah. 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 Well, they did more, a little more. Uh, the initial reaction, initial research showed that he did have. An, an yeah, advantage, yeah, yeah. and then the, exactly. then more research came in, and and they said it's not clear that he does. And given that, we're we're letting him compete. Right. I would think his advantage increases if he were to run, say, an 800, mm -hmm. uh, because it takes him a while to get going, and then you've got some mechanical advantage. Uh, He's in a tough event, huh? Yeah. 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 And it, and actually, he probably couldn't run in a, a lap race because it would be, I think, very dangerous um, since you're not in, mm -hmm. in lanes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there, there are other issues there, but I think now it's, uh, it's fine and I don't see it being more than anomaly. It'll draw some attention maybe yeah. to yeah. people that wouldn't normally pay attention to running maybe to be good, but yeah. I don't, I mean, um, we'll see, yeah. Anybody ever heard of the Noon Group? I have. Anybody ever anybody ever <laughs> seen a bunch of old guys out <laughs> running at noon? Killed themselves. <laughs> old guys, old guys. They run really slow now. Alan's nodding his head like over us. here. <laughs> yeah, like us. Are you part of the noon group? Alan. No, no, no. Are you oh, part um, of the noon group? No, I run with the ones that are yeah. The yeah. noon yeah. group. Actually, the noon group must have been. They ran in gray sweats back in the days when you could get gray sweats at the at the at the PE. Um, check out mm -hmm. and they would meet at noon every day old guys professors faculty staff whatever and they'd go putting around around town but those guys that was part of wasn't dr mcmurtry yeah. part of that group that they were part of the original bowerman jogging group mm -hmm. when he brought jogging in the 60s mm -hmm. and those guys were started running and that group of guys in their gray PE checkout mm -hmm. sweats have been, uh, that group's been going ever since. And some of them are, are 80, Ray Hyman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, they're still going. Yeah, they're mm -hmm. that, yeah that's Eugene. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we weren't jazzercise or, <laughs> you know, the latest whatever, you know, we, we uh, stayed with it. Mm -hmm. Who's the guy that runs his age? Mm -hmm. Oh, pa John Postlewaite. Any, anybody had Professor Postlewaite? Yeah. I mean, he turned biology teacher. Wasn't he yeah. sixty-three? Mm -hmm. Or I mean, I mean, he was he uh, running age, sixty-three yeah, right. miles he on runs his birthday. His age. Yeah. He runs his age in Every one year. run. Yeah, his so friends he sort of joined him. Mm -hmm. And for a while, he was doing it on his birthday. Yeah. When he turned forty-five, he ran forty-five miles that day to celebrate his birthday. And when he turned mm -hmm. forty-six, he ran forty-six miles. And he was in his 60s last year. Yeah, and now he's gotten to the yeah. stage where he can't, gotten to the point where he can't do it on the day, <laughs> but because he, he has to train really hard and, <laughs> and be ready because he's 60, 60, or 60 and a bunch. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, isn't it, didn't he win some university awards for teaching? I mean, he's quite prominent. Yeah. Yeah, Paul Slovic. Yeah, Paul Slovic, right. He's, he's, he's a yeah. Um, yeah, right, founder of Oregon Very Research Institute and yeah. Decision, yeah, yeah. Still out there. So what do you need to know about Oregon running, Oregon track, Oregon? Tom, here's a question. Were you the only coach to ever stay in one university that you know of? 
Uh, you're the only coach I know of. of your whole career at one university. So I went to Arizona years. State. We had three administrations in my four years. So well, <laughs> they, all got, they, all got, they all cheated. Yeah, got they all fired. cheated. Yeah, that's yeah. true. That's true. They're all taken from the till, right? Yeah. That's that that's money they lot. gave you. Yeah, yeah, that money they gave the table. But, but I, don't, I can't think of any other coach well, yeah. in the country that stayed at one university for yeah. their whole career. John, well, I kind of started at the top. I mean, yeah. the bottom was the top. The top was the bottom. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. I mean, when yeah. I started coaching, I, you know, I was a graduate student, and mm -hmm. my, my, I, I got a, I got the huge, the biggest TA ship you could possibly get. My first year was sixty two hundred dollars plus free tuition, and in return for that, I was the head coach of, of, of the women's intercollegiate track team and the cross country team. And, and then the next year it was a real job and I got fourteen thousand dollars. Pretty good money back then. So yeah. What am I gonna do with fourteen thousand dollars? It's almost as much as Vin's getting, huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Whoa, it was big time. It was big time. Well it was it was a real job. And then we had scholarships, but at one point the coaching staff of women's athletics actually this was in Two years before we had scholarships, we had we sat down at a, at a had a roundtable discussion and decided philosophically, we did not want to have women's athletic scholarships at Oregon. We thought it was a mm. bad idea because we thought the be the men's model was a bad model. And two years later, we had athletic scholarships, and away we went and never looked back. An aside. John, a lot was going very surprised with the news of the trial to come back to Eugene. Did this kind of surprise you folks? And what was going on behind the scenes that uh, mm -hmm. you just had? What did it like backstage? Uh, we're well, on the board. I wasn't, so. I wasn't backstage, yeah. so I don't no, know. No, we're on the board, so I know about it. But, yeah. yeah. Laura knows a lot. I, I can yeah. go back a little bit before Laura was yeah. here. I mean, in, in the 80s and 90s, I mean, two factories were at work. One, mm -hmm. in uh, some cases, uh, like Los Angeles in 84 mm -hmm. and Atlanta in 96, uh, were cities that were going to be hosting the Olympic Games, so the, the trials were going to be there. That was obvious. Mm -hmm. And then a lot more requirements came along mm -hmm. for for people to bid. And you know, we didn't have the hotel rooms. Mm -hmm. We didn't have the big sugar daddy to mm -hmm. give it. I mean, Oregon Track Club just didn't have hundreds of thousands of mm -hmm. dollars to even bid in the first place, mm -hmm. much less to uh, be able to risk mm -hmm. in putting on the event. And so. You know, a lot of things happened here uh, you know, about five years ago with mm -hmm. changing in coaching staff mm -hmm. and uh, maybe Laura can say something diplomatically here. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Be diplomatic, Laura. Well, it was yeah. a, there's on. only three cities really in the bidding originally and one was, was Cincinnati or was it Columbus? Yeah, and then Sacramento of, uh, wanted to yeah, and Sacramento. Yeah, and Sacramento doorway. had been there twice yeah. in a row and I think people were getting a little tired of it being in Sacramento. And they weren't, they filled the stands, but you could be in Sacramento and there was, no one else no. knew it was there. Like there was other events going on in town. People were like, oh, the trials are in town? Versus in Eugene, one of the things they could sell it with is they knew all of Eugene would know that the trials were going on. But literally you could walk yeah. out on the street in Sacramento and someone would say, what's this crowd coming from? You know, they had no idea. So that was one of the selling um, points, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> of course, um, we have we have we have the big neighbor of, to the north that helps us out a little bit, you know, um, yeah. that call, created Tracktown USA. So that had something to do with, it, of course. Um, so without without them, there probably would, would be no it, trials. Yeah. Without you know the Nike the Nike people, really, there's no. Well, yeah. and without Ben being here. Yeah, yeah without Ben and without Nike. I mean, track is going. That was part of his hiring. Yeah, yeah. I would right. assume too yeah. is to, to bring the trials here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But to be able to get it here, I mean, given that he, he got hired in August of yeah. 2005, yeah, I mean, he got trials, introduced yeah. right out there. Am I pointing mm -hmm. the right way this time? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Powell Plaza yeah, yeah. in August of 2005, and we got the trials. October? Wasn't it in October? In I think it was October, wasn't it? He was at the NCAA cross country meet. November. Oh, it was November of 2005. Yeah. From August of 2005, we were dead in the water. And November of 2005, mm -hmm. they were, he was on his way to the NCAA cross-country meet-in at Terre Haute 
and he called me and said, Tom, we got the trials because mm -hmm. they had just done all the, mm -hmm. all the, all the bidding, mm -hmm. the, the, the presentations in Indianapolis. Yeah. It, it, and I, so I think didn't the USA Track and Field keep sort of delaying the process mm -hmm. for us? So yeah, and, and yeah. the people at Sacramento were just yeah. September one was the, they yeah. September yeah. one was originally was the deadline. Yeah, and it kept extended. getting extended out, extended yeah. out. Basically, we needed to get our bid together. With, we, I think we had five or six weeks to get it together, and we <laughs> exceeded that. I don't think ours got into October one, and then they they made the decision shortly after that. So, yeah, other other town the cities that have put it on really have sort of a, a sports you know consortium mm -hmm. of sports authority mm -hmm. that puts on you know this Olympic trials and that Olympic mm -hmm. trials, and as Laura says, it's. You, you don't feel like you're anything special there. You just mm -hmm. you know plug in the uh, trials event and that's mm -hmm. that. And so what's happening with the Eugene 08 theme? Uh, you know, it's more than the Olympic trials. It's Eugene 08, yeah, which em encompasses a lot and uh, encompasses an enormous <coughs> number of community groups. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I can be pretty jaded, and I'm just astounded at the volunteers and all the interest in so many different areas. So uh, I think something very special is being created here. Our other Olympic trials were fantastic track meets, but this goes uh, to an incredible degree to do a, a, a different kind of experience, which will last you know, much longer than the, the uh, days of competition themselves. I'm the Olympic <laughs> trials historian. That's Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm the historian, yeah. okay? <laughs> okay, and that and Janet was gonna be the historian, but she pawned off on me. Actually, what that means is I'm keeping the Olympic trials scrapbook. Oh, and I, I put an hour today, I'm about three months behind, and I got 165 pages under plastic. Uh, in I, I filled two scrapbooks already on Olympic trials clippings, mm -hmm. and we're still 30, uh, 30, days, 30, 30, whatever, <laughs> some, 30 some yeah. days away from the Olympic mm -hmm. trials, and I'm three months behind, and I've got 165 pages of stuff about the Olympic trials, including, including how many hotels they've been trying to build in Eugene in the last. Yeah. Anybody yeah. notice that one on the freeway over there by Denny's? You know, yeah. Yeah. they're trying to get that baby done. Yeah. They're, they're they already, they've already rented all the rooms. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you rented a room. You rented a room. Yeah. We got a neighbor who just rented out a room, boom, like that. Put it on Craigslist and rent, rent, rented a bedroom in her house, just boom, like that. For, uh, so, so what are the Sigma Chi's getting? Sigma Chi's. What are they getting? Susie Walsh got her hall. So yeah. Yeah. Anybody live in Bean Hall? <laughs> you know what? I stayed in Bean Hall during the Olympic trials in 1972. And it was cold. <laughs> I stayed there in 76. And the rooms were small in 1972. <laughs> I was in a double room. I was in a supposedly a double room, but I was feeling like I was in a cell. It was so claustrophobic in there. In Bean Hall, 1976. <laughs> Good place. Yeah. Who lives in this building? Is it big? Big. This is going to be in great demand yeah. a few weeks yeah. from now. Have this you heard about the flood? <laughs> did, you, <laughs> did you hear about the flood last year? <laughs> the flood last year? <laughs> I, I, a guy in my running club was on the receiving end of the football and didn't catch it. <laughs> <laughs> he shall remain nameless and he's no longer at this school. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. I think you realize what, if you're a runner, you're a small part of something that's really huge here in Eugene, and it's gone on for a long, long time. I travel a lot, and I tell people I'm from Eugene. They may not know where Eugene is. They may think it's a suburb of Portland, mm -hmm. uh, but they know about running in Eugene. They know the word Cree. Mm -hmm. They know this is a running capital. This is a place that runners want to come to, and uh, it's, it kind of reminds me of my school that I went to in Iowa, Drake University. Drake University uh, holds a big track meet each year called the Drake Relays. And when I tell people I'm from Des Moines, they say, oh yeah, Drake, Drake, uh, Drake, Drake Relays. And I say, what school did you go to? And I say, Drake <laughs> University. And they say, oh yeah, that's the school that's named after the track meet. <laughs> 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 so Eugene's the same, same way. And uh, it, it goes, it started at the university, the whole running culture here, but it's gone way beyond the university now. And the Eugene Marathon, for instance, which was held about a month ago, mm -hmm. second year, 6,000 runners from almost every state. 
and many of them outside the country. And they're drawn here because of the name Eugenie. And this is something that probably is a result of the whole renaissance in Eugene, Eugene track and field and, and running. Because we did go through a period mm -hmm. where it was kind of a downtime mm -hmm. here in, in the, the city. The, the, the previous marathon, which was held in Eugene, died in the early 1980s, and no one saw fit or had the means to resurrect it until just this past year, in 2007. And it's taken off wonderfully. And there, the, the Eugene, uh, the Oregon Track Club Elite Club has come to Eugene. Brad has brought his group to Eugene. Tom uh, tried to retire and it didn't take, and now he's <laughs> coaching the uh, the U of O Running Club, which won national championships last year in both men and women. So no, what, no matter what level of runner you are, there's a great support system for you here in Eugene. Uh, Eugene Running Company has runs almost every day of the week, mm -hmm. right? Whether you, <laughs> whether you like it or not. Because <laughs> yeah. they put in long, long days yeah. there. Uh, the marathon group that I am involved with uh, was, is sponsored by the Eugene Running Company, and it got so big that they, it spun off another group, which Laura yeah. coaches, mm -hmm. and uh, another group of walkers mm -hmm. there they have runs on Mondays and Tuesdays and, and Thursdays, and Thursdays, and yes, and uh, Saturday and, and Sunday. <laughs> and and uh, so they never, almost never close. Yeah, it seems like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's been a great addition. That they've just been here since 2005 or uh, four? yeah, this is 2004. Our, it'll be four years yeah. in October. Yeah, and uh, so uh, and almost, as I should say, whatever level you're at, uh, there's somebody here that uh, you can find somebody to run with, and that's I just. It's almost unheard of anywhere else in the country to have such a, a diversity of, of runners, and so many of them. Right. So if, um, I mean, you're saying there was sort of a renaissance, but there's all these runners who are here, you know, have been and have been here. here. Mm -hmm. And is it just really the events that 1980 was the last big event, and now, or like, sort of what 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 led to the dip or the downturn? Was it just um, that there was? It, it goes in cycles. Uh, when I was training, when I first moved here in 93, we had a huge group training, a huge group of elites. And after the 96 Olympics, probably because it was in America, the, the Olympics that year, in 96, that's why so many of us were here. And then everyone kind of got old and retired or just moved away after 96, probably because it just says the Olympics were no longer in America. You know, they, they went to, uh, what was 2000? Sydney. Sydney. No, Sydney. Sydney. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think that was part of it. Plus, a lot of us were aging, too. I think that's what happened. I mean, because there were probably... 40 or 50 of us at the time probably training in the town and um, it was kind of sad to see it happen because all of a sudden it went from 40 or 50 down to about 10 yeah. um, but it, it's cyclical I saw that happening even like in the 80s and stuff so I knew it would come back um, it came back in about 2004 2005 and it, I'm sure it, we'll probably see it again it's just gonna be a cyclical thing um, and also just generations too I see the difference in generations the attitude of, of runners compared to you know, in like pre-Fontaine's era, they trained, I think, so hard. They did a lot of speed and stuff like that. And then we kind of had a lull in distance running where we don't, we didn't have American men didn't run marathons until they turned like 30. So we, we lost all our best guys, I think, to age. They they waited too long to marathon. That's not happening now. Now you see Dathan Ritzenheim, who's what, 25 years old, 24 yeah, years old. 25. Ryan Hall, who's 25. what, 23, 25. 25 These guys are finally like, oh, I'll run a marathon. They're not waiting till they're 30. So that's part of it too. That's why you're seeing these guys run great times now. You wait till you're 30, especially for guys, they're starting to slow down. Women were, were doing better after 30, but men weren't. And so I, that's part of it too, I think. And I think these guys are training harder. I think we had a little guys, guys in when both they weren't training as hard as they, they used to, like in the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. So that was part of it. Now they're it's, they're they're doing it harder training, I think. So. And I think your point is right that there's always been runners here. I mean, mm -hmm. as long as. I've lived here as long as Janet's mm -hmm. been here, uh, and she's been here the longest. Mm -hmm. And but uh, the this, the the organizational side has waxed and waned over the years, mm -hmm. and that and that's what's really come back strong now. Uh, I mentioned the running company, but there's also and, and the marathon, but there's also groups or or individuals who have uh, gotten into the race organizing business for road mm -hmm. runners, and uh, there's a lot of lot more club activity now. A lot of more group activity, um, and so uh, uh, it's not. If somebody chooses to run alone mm -hmm. and never run a race, that's just fine. It, that, that's still <laughs> available to them. But those who do want to join up someplace, they have the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, OTC is one organization that's that's been here throughout to yeah. take the tent. Um, is, is that is this is this really unique to, to Eugene? Do others, are there other? I, I think the the age the 
longe longevity of the club is something the Oregon, Oregon Track, Track Club, club yeah. uh, was founded. I mean, Bowerman got this group going. It was an offspring from the active 2030 club, which is still around, which provided officials, mm -hmm. uh, meet officials. And so the track club grew out of that in uh, the, the mid 50s. And that was sort of the vehicle for bringing together, you know, some pretty uh, high rollers in the in, in influential people in the community. Uh, you know, the mayor might be mm -hmm. the president one year, Les Anderson, whose son, John Anderson, you know, made the Olympic team here mm -hmm. in 1972. There was a story about him in the paper recently. Uh, anyhow, so the club, you know, sort of, you know, went with the times in terms of, um, you know, a, a master's group over the last 20 years has become really vibrant. Maybe it was mm -hmm. just people who'd been, uh, you know, open athletes just got older mm -hmm. and still wanted to compete. Uh, it, but it also drew in a lot of new athletes who hadn't competed before and hey, maybe they're 45, but this mm -hmm. looks like fun. And, and there was a group uh, to do that. The, the club went through s several variations of support for elite athletes. Mm -hmm. I mean, there'd be big arguments about, you know, Bowerman, you know, why are we supporting these hamburger runners, you know? And, uh, <laughs> it, it wasn't always pretty at club meetings with arguing over who should get what. Mm -hmm. um, then some of the groups sort of spun off and became somewhat independent, and now we have this totally new <laughs> formation with the Oregon Track Club Elite, mm -hmm. which really is a group funded by Nike mm -hmm. and licensed that's correct. We're, the club yeah. has licensed its yeah. name, Oregon Track Club, uh, to this group, and the, the track club is benefiting because apparel, Oregon Track Club Elite apparel, apparel is being sold all over the world, mm -hmm. and we get twenty-five cents a shirt, or I don't know. Uh -huh. We, we get we get <laughs> some, we get something <laughs> something from it. So uh, things have changed a lot, you know, marketing and business have. Mm -hmm changed and uh, community interest has, has changed into different areas and the, the club I think really has you know, grown in, in those times. different ways to, mm -hmm. to meet uh, the times and the new interests. There's kind of a lost generation there of, of people who who are part of Oregon Track who went away and really weren't influential in, in Oregon Track and, and probably coulda, woulda, shoulda, but somehow if they just never got involved and the, the leadership within track and field with the men's and women's team split and and so on um, we weren't making it happen and there just wasn't sort of a high-powered organization of people interested in track and field through the late 80s and, and, and all the way through the 90s and track and field you know we you know we were not track city USA we were not the track capital of the world and when Martin Smith came in in 1999 or whatever track was he was determined he was going to have a successful team, and he went at it his way, mm -hmm. but his way wasn't the traditional Oregon way because he realized he couldn't beat Vin Lanana's teams at Stanford because Vin got all the distance runners. Mm -hmm. So how are we going to beat them? We're going to beat them with everything but distance runners. And he was on the way to doing it. In fact, the year that he got forced out here, the spring of 2005, they did exactly that. They won the, the Pac-10 title scoring all the points around distance, but not, <laughs> not much in distance. <laughs> and that didn't set well with the lost generation, with, with, with people in Nike, with powerful people who said, no, that's not the Oregon way to be successful. And, and within a matter of, you know, of less than a year, uh, so, Martin, so Martin was out, Vin was in, and the money started to flow. Mm -hmm. And with, with Vin's incredible energy and ability to get you to want to do what he wants you to do, <laughs> and you do it, and you want to do it, um, he he can he can make stuff happen along with all the money that's flowed from flowed from Portland, and so you know here we are, and it's and there's no telling where it's going to stop because it's it's so big time right now. When when Vin got here in the fall of 2005, he said we want to have a cross country race. Say, good, he, he wanted to have it on Tree's Trail. Okay, that's an okay place, but it's kind of narrow for a cross-country race. He said, let's have it, can we start the race in front of the athletic department on the big, grassy, beautiful athletic field so, all, so 
so everybody can stand up in the, in, the, in the Casanova Center and watch the race start right from the, okay. And I said, well, we could, we could do it. I think he wanted me to set up the course. And I said, well, I think we could probably do it, but you know, you only got about 250 yards and then you got to go out a gate and then you've got four lanes of, of asphalt bef you know, bef and, and curbs before you get over to Priest Trail. And Vin said, we could build a ramp over that for 10,000 bucks. <laughs> I thought, whoa, <laughs> things are different than they used to be. <laughs> well, we didn't build the ramp, but we did have the race on, on Freeze Trail. Didn't like it. And they renovated Freeze Trail. And they renovated yeah, Freeze Trail. And yeah. Freeze Trail is now wider than it used to be so that those races can be held there. Mm -hmm. So all of us benefit from the things that are happening yeah. at the top. Yeah. We've got a better Hayward Field. We've got a better Freeze Trail yeah. now yeah. as a result. Yeah. And a better bike path as, as yeah. a result because yeah. now... Uh, largely because of the Olympic trials, yeah. they put posts up every quarter mile. Mm -hmm. And not just the plaques that you have to look really hard to see, but there's and a post you, you can see from a quarter mile right. away. And you don't have to run on Good Pasture Island Road anymore and take yeah. your life in your hands. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> right. You used to. Yeah, that's right. New light poles on the way from here to Autzen Stadium. Yeah. Putting them in right now. Yeah. Why are they doing that? Are they doing that for us? Are they doing that for us? Is that right? There's new lights in South Eugene. A lot of the uh, tidewalks. No, a lot of, a lot of the uh, cows are going to be at night, apparently, right? Yeah, during the week. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, well. Yeah. We've got a brief statement of our yeah. Yeah. No, go no, ahead. Okay. What, uh, okay. On with the show. Yeah. Well, we yeah. The, the each the history of Hayward Field is five minutes, and Freeze yeah. Trail is five minutes. So and so uh, I think they're, they're well worth seeing. They're, they're just recently released and, uh, and very professionally done. You're welcome to stay and talk with the panel or have some refreshments, so I'll go ahead and In other words, they say better than we did what, uh, <laughs> what this all means to the community. So we're going to do the history of Hayward Field. History of Hayward, and Hayward and Field and Freeze Trail, okay. yeah. Cool. No, yeah, these are just just released. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It didn't just happen. Giant carpet <laughs> out of Christine Peters and Hayward, Bowerman, Bellinger, and Free. Cornerstone clearly, but joined by hundreds to create this unique American story. Not just a tradition for a program, but an identity for an entire community. Nail by nail, board by board, stride by stride, champion after champion. All of it linked together in these shadows that have become a witness to it all. It's a history so immense, simple words can't do it justice. Did Bill Hayward in 1904 know what it would or could become? His daring vision as the forefather of Oregon track and field, his 44-year career, his venturing of four world records, six American records, nine Olympians, and the birth of a simple venue that proudly carries his name more than 100 years later showing both the dignity and the strength that characterized his tenure. As if preordained, it was similar strength and the Oregon Trail pioneering spirit of Bill Bowerman that used that foundation to create Eugene's national identity. It isn't just the four NCAA championships, the 24 individual NCAA titles, the 33 Olympians, or the 64 All-Americans. It is every single individual he touched carrying his spirit and complicated wisdom that continues to grab thousands right around the neck today. From a former athlete and Olympian and test runner that became his biographer, to a young man from Cleveland High School in Portland with a vision who simply loved running and loved Oregon, their partnership embodies everything that makes up the history of track and field in Eugene. Unbreakable spirit, innovation, confidence, leadership, and faith in each other and hard work and sometimes even in things a bit out of their control. Because of these giants and their immense vision, the spectacle of the Olympic trials at Hayward Field in 1972, 76, and 1980 grips not just Eugene, but the entire world. In the same era that Bowerman's ideals and ideas on and off the track were being shared from Australia and Japan to Munich and beyond, it was Eugene that carried the sport. Every image of free adding to the history of the already storied track he ran on. 
his fire becoming the fire of thousands of fans, Free's ability to transfer his energy to the people who crowded and stood and peered to see his every move is the energy of this war in Eugene. His death so shocking, but even in death, like Hayward and Bowerman, his popularity and impact remain strong. Young runners throughout the world know Free today as if he runs side by side with them, every step, every workout, every day. The Free Fontaine Classic is proof. The biggest track and field league in the nation every year, filling lanes and seats at Hayward Field in late spring. It's a beat that honors Free and fortifies Eugene's fans as the center of the sport in this country. In life, Free was inseparable with Bill Dellinger. His 25 years as the successor to Bowerman are stories. But today, what is somewhat forgotten is that Dellinger stands aside as one of Oregon's greatest distance runners ever. Under Bowerman, the three-time All-American won two NCAA championships. He held two world records, six American records, and made three appearances in the Olympic Games, highlighted by a bronze medal in the 1964 Olympics. A bronze in which Dellinger led on the final lap, much like three would eight years later in Munich. Salazar, Chapa, Central, McChesney Jr., among so many others, 18 American records, and Oregon's fifth NCAA track and field championship. At the same time, the emergence of a women's program in Oregon helped energize the spirit that is Track Town USA. Pioneered by Tom Heinemann, 27 years as the Oregon head coach, but his reach going well beyond the NCAA championships in track and field in 1985 and cross country in 83 and 87. His athletes, with three American records and 17 Olympic appearances, 12 individual U.S. national titles, 12 seasons of undefeated dual meets, and an amazing career record of 124 and 21. All of it under the watchful eyes of history, embodied by these simple wood benches. The coats of paint fit each witnessing an era that made the next one possible. And now, it has come full circle an Oregon program with two of the last three Pac-10 championships. A new leader rekindling those shadows that walk with him down the lanes and embracing what they represent. The reemergence of the Oregon Track Club and the volunteerism that stands out, forging ahead for the love of the sport and the history here that carries. And the staging of yet another Olympic trials in 2008. Eugene beating cities that can offer more of most everything, seats, money among them but can't offer the spirit of Eugene. Nor this old place that will become new again. This place that will see yet another layer of paint. Another era in its infancy. What will it see? Our future is our history. That is Track Town USA. Trail is, is the hallmark, the trademark for this whole Eugene community. Every young man or young woman who is a distance runner knows of Free Trails. They may not have ever been here, but they know what it means and what it's all about. You're in the middle of the city, but once you go out there, you're not around any traffic. And you go through meadows and woods. You go through dappled sunlight, you go past the Autzen Stadium. It's 4.7 miles and you can train on it every day and it's never quite the same. When you go out there and you look at it, you go, hey, yeah, that's, that's nice. It's a nice running trip. It looks nice, it's great, it's fun to run on. But what you don't understand is all the work we've done for the last seven years, and particularly in the last five years, to get that up to a condition that is just a primo condition. As far as I am concerned, it's one of the best running trails in the world, not just for fame, but for actually running on. Priest Trail we use probably almost every day, either as part of a warm-up or a routine on the track at Hayward Field, or for their normal long runs or for their training runs. Free Trail is uh, miles and miles of soft surface, but not so soft that you have difficulty being able to maintain your form and your stride. It's really a, it's a great surface. The hundreds of thousands of dollars have gone into this, 
in donations, both in kind and in equipment and monies. They have thousands of hours of manpower helping us out on this trail. I can't say how grateful I am to the people who helped do this project. It's, uh, I mean, it's a true community project. When people think of Eugene, Track Down, USA, they think immediately of Purdue, Steve Freebunton, and it memorializes his toughness, his competitiveness, and I think that the trail is something that is a connecting point for just about every athlete who has an interest in distance running or jogging or running or fitness. I think it represents something really special. I'm not sure that there is anything else in the city of Eugene that is as well known around the world as the Steve Prefontaine Memorial Running Trail. Priest Trail is different from any other place around the country. There may be a trail, there may be uh, something that's maintained, there may be some lights on a running surface, but there's nothing like Prefontaine. Not just the physical part of it, but the spiritual side of it. Kenny Moore's book, uh, Bowerman in the Men of Oregon. We had an autographed copy of that book at our house, autographed by all the coaches who came for um, for Pac-10, and our dog ate, ate the dust cover <laughs> and the page of all the autographs. <laughs> Kyle Callahan. <laughs> I'm running with the dog. Okay. He's still loving it. Winner of this is back to Pat, Andrew Gutzel. Andrew. Is this the UGO Eagle? Yeah, it's UGO Eagle. See what's worth coming. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again.
again, like I said, yeah, thank you. Thank you.